All right, team. Well, welcome to our second meeting of the Child Outcomes Accountability Team. Uh, just as a reminder, you know, the purpose of bringing this group together is, again, to look at our leadership across the state and figure out how we can collectively improve child outcomes across the board, not just in one sector, but really across all, all of our different sectors. Um, you know, when we look at this child outcomes accountability team, we are focused on integration and coordination of early childhood public and private partners, a again, committed to health development and well being of kids and families. And for today's discussion, you know, one of the key things that we wanted to start with, given what we're seeing across the state and across the country and in increase of COVID cases. Um, is to hear from you all about what are your, you know, your top concerns and priorities. So one of the things we recognize, and Brina, thank you for being on, and Elizabeth Gilman, and other folks who are being called for COVID emergency response all over again, or at, at an increased pace. So some of our health partners are not going to be able to be on the call today. Um, but again, I think what we, what we want to hear from this group as we're thinking about next steps for this team is uh, what's being prioritized? How are we gonna be able to inform decision-making based on what's happening on the ground within regions and across this group? Uh, and where there are efficiencies uh, to bring us together versus kind of uh, having this duplication. So I'd like to start with a reflection question, which is given the surge in COVID cases in our state and the recent socialization restrictions, what are your biggest concerns priorities and emerging needs from partners and families. And I can post that quickly in the chat if it isn't already there, but I would love to do this popcorn style. So as folks are, uh, are able to answer or have a response, please feel free to come on. What are you facing now? I can start us off. Thanks, Amy. Um, and it, it'll be a little bit of an amalgamation of my uh, monthly focus group, the Strengthening Families grantees. Um, so I started off our call talking about um, surge capacity, like our surge capacity, um, as either people in programs or in, however they wanted to talk about it. And it was really a pretty interesting discussion and I, they welcomed it and I got a lot of thanks after and all that kind of stuff because people are so stressed out. <laughs> Um, and what I mostly heard from people won't be a surprise, but it's basically that when this work of responding to an acute crisis and planning and all of that, for even for people who like change and thrive on change and all that, um, when this first happened, they approached it with fear of the unknown but a lot of sort of one person said like vim and vigor, right? Like her mom used to say. And now um, they are finding that they are depleted, that they just, you know, uh, don't have the energy to approach it with the same, they're going back to the old restructuring and the old planning and pulling up all the old stuff. Um, and so I, I asked them to talk about, you know, strategies and people said everything from, I have a, an app on my work phone and I took it off. So I wouldn't get the small interruptions. I figured people who really needed me for emergencies would call me. This was a director of a program. Um, they're feeling like they have to be more careful with health checks. I'm just looking quickly at my notes here. Um, they're really battling with parents over symptoms. Their staff is burnt out. Um, uh, and one of them said a humorous thing is that no one ever read their newsletters and now the parents are asking for it for social connections. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Amy. I think uh, many of us are feeling that way and are hearing that from families and providers. So thank you for, for starting the call with that. What else are folks prioritizing? Nice to see your face, Brina. I think for us at VFM, we're, I would echo a lot of what Amy said. Families are, are brought with further with confusion about what's going to be best for them, for their children. 
you know, the whole piece with, with school remote and not, and all of the other pieces around it, the unpredictability of schedules and life in general, further isolation for upcoming holidays, um, people are just really struggling. So I think the connection that we're able to make, and to your point, current and credible information is is something that and I'm finding that with my staff as well, most of whom are also parents of kids with special health needs and disabilities. Um, people are really tired, but um, they're trying to rise to the occasion and we're trying to figure out ways to continue to build morale and connection and to think about the future while we're in the midst of all of this again. And I think, you know, there's some hope on the horizon too with, with the conversations about a new administration, vaccine, et cetera. So, um, we're trying our best to hold on to hope and to move forward together. Thank you, Pam. I'm sorry I was late. What is the prompt? I mean, I'm getting it from context clues. Sure, Amy. Yeah. So we were we were starting out by saying, you know, we recognize that we're seeing another surge in COVID. So across the state, what are your biggest concerns? What are the priorities? And what are you seeing as the emerging needs of families and partners? Yeah, I, I just got off a call. That's why I was late. Um, and we were talking about how are we able to support families who are feeling really socially isolated. So I agree with everything that Pam and Amy B said, and that's really linked to it's the holidays. This is usually a time when people come together. People who you haven't seen in a long time fly, might fly in or you're flying somewhere and seeing family and friends. And it's supposed to be this really happy together kind of time and people are now hunkered down in their homes with their immediate family. Um, worried about like is school going to go fully remote and so we're trying to figure out what are ways that we can help families to have opportunities to socially engage and interact. Um, in a way that's safe and then that <sighs> alongside the conversation of now that a lot of agencies are moving to fully telehealth supports for families, we have to figure out like what's the balance for us as a PCC and a DA um, in helping to support our high acuity families and families. I feel like a broken record because I feel like I said this a bunch in March too. Like how are we supporting families who don't have telehealth means, high acuity families, um, families who are really worried about because when we went remote and then we started to trickle back in, we walked into some really scary situations that I think back, thank God we decided to have people go back into the homes because those could have ended um, in a really different way. Um, and so making sure the support staff and help them to feel safe but also make sure that we're not closing the door completely on families who are um, who need us and specifically high risk families who are really worried about. Thanks, Amy. I can follow up on that. Can you all hear me okay? Oh, my box lit up, great. Um, so I've just, I completely agree with what everyone else has said. I think um, what I'm hearing a lot of is around literally child outcomes in terms of their developmental outcomes, cognitive, social, and emotional. So not only do children not necessarily have the same kind of academic richness in their lives as they did before, but then they're also lacking in that social, um, those social connections. Um, so, you know, what impact is that going to have in a year, in three years, in five years, um, I think folks are nervous about that. Um, the other big thing is the staffing crisis and, and not having enough people and the people who are working in the field are stressed and um, overburdened and, and, and they're burning out faster. So it just seems like we're getting closer and closer to the bottom of the well in terms of um, professionals in this field who can support our children in the ways that they need. Um, the other issue coming up is really uh, just the, it's exacerbating kind of the interplay between school districts and childcare, right? The, the PK through 12 system and childcare. Um, and the fact that, you know, school districts are operating under a great amount of local control and in some areas, you know, not really taking into consideration the impact that has 
on everything else, on childcare programs. Um, so that's really been heightened. You've got folks working in childcare who often have kids in the school system. So what does that mean when they move to remote? And what does it mean if schools go remote and, you know, parents in a similar situation have a school-age kiddo and a childcare kiddo? And it's like, well, if my school-age kiddo isn't going, then maybe my, you know, and I'm home anyway, then what's the point of accessing childcare, you know? thinking about access to UPK. Um, we talked about that recently with AOE and just are folks taking advantage of those UPK hours? Are they able to access that? Um, that's another issue. Uh, and then substance misuse. Um, so I participate on a few work groups through the Substance Misuse Prevention Council and just hearing about the surge um, and folks reaching out for help, particularly around alcohol abuse. I mean, I think we've been really focused on the opioid issue, which is still a challenge, but uh, I want to say they had something, Vermont Help Link, um, a resource through ADAP, I believe, they reported something like an increase of like 40% in folks contacting them around alcohol, um, alcohol misuse issues. So again, what's the impact on on families. And if you've got kids at home and you've got adults who are now coping through substance misuse, what's the impact that that has on those kiddos? Um, but I'll end on a silver lining, which <laughs> I think is in a weird way, the transportation issue, like living in a rural area, we've heard for years and years, families can't access the services they need because of a lack of transportation. And this crisis really has forced practitioners to think about offering services remotely. So you know, while they may not be completely appropriate for folks like Amy was saying, who really need that in-person support, um, I think it it is now that practitioners have kind of pivoted a little bit and are open to offering those telehealth services or those more remote services, I think there's an opportunity to, to reach more folks because we don't have to worry about the transportation barrier. Thank you, Renee. I can Hi, share. this is Jen Fortman. Can, can you all hear me? Yes. Hi, Jen. Um, great. So I have just been thinking a lot about um, kind of like everybody's goal, as Governor Scott has been mentioning lately, about keeping children in school. Even if we're kind of locked down, um, it's really important to keep children in school and in-person learning. Um, and so providing or helping to provide resources on how to build immunity from home, um, you know, certain vitamins that could help um, just off the top of my head, like vitamin C, is that something that families are taking and giving to their children? Um, I feel like the health, I mean, obviously the healthier our children are and the stronger their immunity is, the longer they'll be able to stay in school. Um, I've been hearing from some parents in the Families and Communities Committee um, just having a hard time with their children needing to stay home from school because their nose is runny. And it, it is concerning, but there are also children who just have runny noses either all winter or all year round. Um, and they have to take time off of work, which they don't have. And it's just this cycle. And so um, just having simple suggestions on what families can do from home to help build their children's immunity um, could go a long way. Thanks, Jen. Brina or Katie? Yeah, hi folks. I am really happy to be here today to, to see all your faces. Uh, so I guess what the most important thing I could share is that uh, we're all hands on deck 24 seven to keep schools open in the state of Vermont. It's the, the safest places we currently have in our society. <laughs> and I can tell you that by data, we have 98,000 students and 18,000 staff, and we've had 76 cases. So is anyone good at math? Because it's, and when we uh, have a case, it's an adult that made a, a decision about his or her behavior on a weekend or a travel or a wedding or an event and then brought it into the school. So. Everything we've done to set up schools with our guidance is working. And 
what I would love to see as a group of old friends and people who've worked together for a long time is that we get into mission critical space. It's not just the pediatrician, you know, it's if public health and the pediatricians are the only ones saying it's safe to be in schools, then it, there's still a lot of people uh, that need convincing or don't have the information they need to be part of that experience because you all come and know that it's important for kids' emotional lives and their learning. But I, I would imagine you also hit up against the anxiety of your teams and people that are not sure it's safe or feeling that all the press and the energy around communities having more cases is somehow a signal that schools aren't safe. So, so that's one thing. The second thing is that the childcare community is like, uh, they're, they're the heroes. They've been the heroes of this story since March and we, we need to talk about it more. I mean, there are a lot of people who stepped back and couldn't continue care for, for kids uh, in that fear space. And I really acknowledge that, but there's a massive group of humans that just got up the very next day after childcare sort of closed and stood right back up and provided care for essential workers. And, and there were, you know, minimal cases in those venues as well. So that's what we need to do together. Short term, you're all describing all there's like short, medium and long term impacts of every single day. We're all exhausted our cortisol, you know, the, to be physiologic for a second, the adrenal gland on the back of our kidneys that squirts cortisol, it's unremitting. You know, we can't get back to that mindful space and and the, the public health system in particular, everybody is just, I mean, my, we haven't had a day off since March 7th and there's no looking back. Uh, I mean, there's so I just feel like we could slow down together and just keep schools open for all the reasons you just described, it's a trickle down, right? If schools close, then the folks that do the work can't work. And if, uh, and then that has impacts on childcare. And so uh, I'm not sure who said it best earlier. There's local control in schools, but not if there's groundswell, not if pediatricians and community partners say it, this, you do not need to close the school. So what happens, with, we go on calls every day with the school that has a case, and the public health advice is close a classroom, and sometimes it's not, not do anything, because in high school, when kids move about, there are no close contacts. It's sort of paradoxical. Early on, we were worried that there would be uh, more exposure with the older kids because of the way they moved about, and it's turned out that it's because schools are safe, older students don't have a lot of close contacts. So I'll stop there. I wasn't sure what Deb, I, I do want you to know that running kids with runny noses have to stay home and I'm, it's terribly disruptive and difficult for families, but we cannot put our caregivers in a position of trying to figure out who has COVID and runny nose is a very prominent symptom in COVID. And, uh, we have a beautiful algorithm and materials for families about, you can go back if a healthcare provider assesses that it isn't COVID or if it resolves and all the other features of a child are back on track, like fevers resolve, mood and energy fine, kids are eating well, if there's still a trickle with the comfort of the provider, there are ways to get back to school or childcare with a runny nose. But uh, these are extraordinary times and we, we can't really fall down on the, on the symptomatology stuff. So. Okay, I'll stop there. I could talk to you all morning. I will mute myself. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brina. Um, and, and you know, a, a part of what's what Brina is reminding us all of is the opportunity for collective impact, right? For this group of early childhood partners to come together and be really vocal about what we know about the evidence and how to best support kids and families right now. So I think that's a really strong reminder. I also think. Um, to Brina's point about uh, the materials that have been created, how do we as an early childhood community do a better job of getting those things to families so that they have the fact sheets, they have the information they need, they, they know where to go to find the resources, all of those things. I think that's another important thing for this group to be grappling with a little bit is, okay, we're spreading a lot of information via social media. What else? Uh, you know, we have private, private, primary partners like PCCs and folks doing home visiting on the ground. How do we give them the tools that families need that Brina's referencing, right? Um, so I think 
you know, there's some opportunity for us to be sharing and disseminating resources and disseminating a more cohesive message. Yeah, we recently redid our uh, website to have, we used to have schools and childcare together and now it's childcare is separate and families are separate so that it's not like a big morass, but we've got some pretty solid materials on illness return and we've got really good messaging about uh, sort of our process with schools. So if the, if you want me to try to send it specifically, I can, but it's, it's sometimes more important to take it through the website so that it stays because we update things a lot. So you don't really want PDFs. You want to yeah. do the website because of that. Awesome. And so let's go to Amy, then Katie, and then Bev. With me, Amy? Yes, Amy Johnson. <laughs> Sorry. I just, I just want to say, Breen, I really appreciate you mentioning that statistic about schools. And I will say that in my all staff meeting and leadership, two leadership meetings this week, we specifically talked about that uh, in, in, in relation to kind of the fear around like, should I go into the home? Like, am I going to catch this? And we talked about, let's look at what's going on in the schools. And when you're doing this work and you're doing it well, and you have the guidelines in place and the policies and procedures in place, it's working. If you're wearing the PPE, if you're using the hand sanitizer, if you're socially distancing, like these things are working. And so these are the measures that we are taking when we go into the homes to keep ourselves safe and our families safe. And we, we use the schools as an example. And people were like, oh yeah, like I'm definitely gonna talk to my staff about that. And when I talked to my staff about that, they were like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So it's just really helpful um, to have the statistics and use them and people do understand them. And it's a great way to connect like this is what's happening in schools. This is what's keeping everybody safe and we can do that too. Um, and then that next day I got a bunch of people who were like, okay, I'm gonna do some additional home visits. So awesome. it was great. Thank you. Yeah, because one of my I my one of my regrets that I'll just share with you all, because we were so focused on childcare and schools, we didn't get the right information to you all about early intervention, home visiting, and how you could do that safely. And so many kids did not get services since March. And uh, the pediatricians a, a month ago called me about it and they, they, they were quite alarmed. You know, it's different every region and I'm certainly not calling anyone out. I understand why people stopped doing developmental services, but it um, we were just about to try to get it back. And I was going to join the CIS group with you all and give kind of a methodical description of how safe it is to go into homes and then the governor and the gathering and it, the wheels came off the bus again from a community perspective Friday. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to implore people to go back into uh, home visiting or developmental services, but I appreciate Amy, this, this, you know, the lessons here are about courageous leadership, which you clearly ha are and leaders have to get the information they need to, to, you know, do what's right for kids, but it's, it's hard to do because someone will get COVID. I mean, this isn't like a, there's not zero risk. And so, you know, the, the phone call when it comes in, like that a kid got COVID in a school from one, a teacher, which has happened like three times, you know, we have three cases, I think maybe four of in-school transmission out of, you know, thousands, thousands, thousands of humans. And you feel like you put somebody at risk. It's a terrible feeling. So leader, it's just important for leadership that you have the support you need that it's not absolute. And that's where we're all, I can hear you all saying that this morning, there's this torturous path of you can't shut down because we already did that and kids are suffering. So I, there's a press release coming out today from the pediatricians that I'll share with you that is long and very descriptive of why we, we cannot stop caring for kids or educate, you know, we can't. And, and then the other thing I'll, I promise I'll end is more and more international and national data that kids are not the vectors. They're, they're not, we've had no kids hospitalized in the state of Vermont, zero since March. So it's not the kids and you guys already know this, it's your staff, it's adults and it's our, um, it's our, um, our behavior as humans. 
Okay, stop. Karina and Amy, and again, it, it it speaks to the importance of some shared messaging, some some kind of collective messaging. How do we blast this across our our networks to make sure that people are hearing this loud and clear with again same language. Um, so I know I outlined a, an order. I know Auburn has to leave early. Uh, so I want to give her a chance to share and saw her hand raised. And then we can go to Katie, Bev, and Amy B. Go ahead, Auburn. Oh, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention, um, I don't feel like my role on this call is as important as those folks on this call right now, because you all are working like, directly with um, providers and or the, the families themselves. And that's so important. I just wanna say thank you so much for all the work you're doing. And I know everyone is exhausted. Um, it's a difficult time. I, I, um, my role has been mostly in supporting workforce um, right now and looking at um, um, sort of making sure that our workforce is um, getting the supports they need around burnout prevention, um, dealing with prolonged stress. And so I'm sitting at different tables that I, you know, or creating different tables that I hadn't, hadn't been in before. Um, there's conversation about telework and how that's going. Um, but I do, I do want to say what I have noticed is this incredible thirst and need from the workforce to um, have more information around burnout. And um, I feel like pandemic fatigue is just too light a phrase. I feel like it's, it's really like Amy Bolger was describing. Um, it's, it's intense now. I mean, um, and I think, you know, the, the lack of staffing too is, is adding to that. So um if in this messaging or if in this sort of collective work that we're doing, we could find a way to include messaging around um, burnout, burnout, I want to say burnout management. I want, I want to recognize that burnout is a phase. It's, it's not the end be all and end all. It, it's not going to end people, but it is a phase that many folks are in and there are ways to manage that level of, um, of stress. And um, I think, you know, we're in burnout, in some ways, burnout management. Um, and, and some of us are still in burnout prevention, which is great. But I do think there are, there are tools and some messaging we can get out around that for the workforce. And I think all of you on the call probably um, have tools and messaging around that for, for parents and families as well. Um, you know, parenting under stress. So I just want to, I just want to give that shout out because that feels like where all of my um, time is going now during, during this COVID time. And um, yeah, so if I can be helpful in any way, um, I also want to make sure that we're, we continue to talk about resilience development and try to focus on our strengths as much as we can, even though we feel like we're in burnout and um, we do have those strengths and we do have those resources. And so um, I continue to kind of pump out the, the messaging around resilience that we've started with the resilience messaging project. And I want to continue to do that as long as it doesn't feel like it's in conflict with what people are experiencing right now. So I have to be very, you know, handle that very carefully. I don't want people to think, oh, we're we're asking people to be gritty right now, you know? So it's kind of a delicate balance at times, but, um, but I do want to keep that, that focus on our strengths and our resilience as, um, as, as Vermont communities are resilient, you know? So anyway, I'll stop Auburn, talking there. I, I, I know that um, a couple of months ago, there were a couple of like handouts that were developed about burnout and identifying and mitigating. I, yep. I don't remember the exact language and I don't know if those have been updated or if it's time to recirculate them. Or again, you know, when we're talking about common messaging, if they can be adapted to um, or for families. Um, yeah, they, they might be able to be adapted for families, certainly for the early childhood workforce. I can send those out again. Um, they do contain like a section on, you know, when you're already um, feeling like you're in burnout, what are some things that you can do? Um, 
and and I have a training that I offer on that around resilience development and burnout prevention. Um, so that I offer that that trains on those handouts um, specifically. But um, but anyway, yeah, I will send those handouts back out. Um, I'm sorry, I can't see who that was that asked that question. This is Dora. Oh, hi, Dora. Um, so Morgan, should I just send them to you to get out to everybody? Yes, that would be great. Okay, and all right, I will, I will do that. And for everyone on the call, if there are resources and things that you want us to be sharing through our Building Bright Futures networks, through social media platforms for this entire group to disseminate, whether it's messaging, flyers, uh, just send them right to Beth and myself and we'll make sure the whole group has access to them. Cool, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so uh, I do wanna get to everyone on the call before we circle back. Uh, Katie, do you wanna go next? Thank you for being so patient. Oh, no problem. And I've missed the last meeting, so I, I feel like I know most of you, but for those who I don't know, my name is Katie Davis and I'm from Hunger Free Vermont. So pardon my absence last week, but or last month, but um, I'm happy to be here. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm thinking about a lot is um, there's been an influx of new feeding programs. Um, so things like the Farmers to Family Food Boxes and Everyone Eats. Um, and a lot of those are going to be ending soon. Um, so in December, and when there is a gap in, in the Families to Farmers Food Boxes in September, the food bank saw a really dramatic increase in the uptake of Veggie Van Gogh. Um, so there's a lot of folks who are really relying on those um, and for whatever reasons, either they don't qualify or they're not interested or they don't know about um, the federal program. So thinking about like Three Squares Vermont um, and other, you know, some of the other like WIC and, and some of those programs that they're not accessing. Um, and how do we how do we make sure that folks who need those programs now know about them and, and really kind of build that understanding that they're there for them, even if they don't need them in this moment when they do need them? Um, and the piece that a bunch of folks have touched upon about just the immense stress that are, people are under and how difficult it is to navigate things when you're in that space. Um, and so how do we provide really clear messaging and, and we're you know, trying to pump out a lot of stuff to share with folks, but it just, it just makes me feel really nervous about folks who are in, in, you know, in, these, in, in different levels of crisis and, and what it means for them to be accessing meals. Um, and accessing the food that they need and, and being able to make choices uh, about what they're putting on their own plates too, because there's so many places in our, in our lives right now where we don't have that choice and how can that be a place where you do have some choice. Um, so things, things around in kind of in that arena have been fluttering around in my mind for months now, but I feel like as, as December approaches, it, it feels a little scarier. Thank you so much for sharing, Katie. I know that a, a lot of us have been talking about food insecurity and how do we support kids and families right now, especially as they may not be in their traditional care settings. Um, so I really appreciate you bringing that back to this group and please share again, any messaging and information with us. We're happy to share that out. Bev, do you wanna go next? Thanks, yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I think I can be um, brief. I, I don't know that I have a lot to add to this wonderful flavor. I've been listening and um, learning from all of you. I, I think the things I most want to say is I want to say, Brina, thank you so much for um, both your recognition of the role of child care during this time, but also really for all that you did in your team in allowing them to reopen safely and feel confident and comfortable. Um, well, maybe not comfortable, but <laughs> feel as confident as possible. Uh, in that reopening and just being there and your team for advice every step of the way we uh, you know again I think this just the silver lining is it highlights um, not only the importance of I think child care um, for um, for children and their social emotional well-being and their um, their growth and development but also for um, the economy for and, and this just listening to you all the interconnectedness between healthcare and education and child care and the economy it's all so interconnected which makes this group I think really special and so thank you for that recognition thank you for all you've done um, to make that possible and um, I, you know and and I, I think the only other thing I would say is I do think that the child care worker stabilization grant from the governor has gone a long way to help um, or will go a long way to help childcare workers feel that we're open 
during the closure period to, that supported um, essential workers and their children, their families. I think that will we appreciate that recognition, like that kind of recognition. I think is really helpful against some of the burnout and um, extra costs um, that that child care centers experience during this. So I don't know that I have anything new to add, but I will share those appreciations and reflections and. I would just say, Tanya, like do you, you're a little closer to the ground to the early care educators. Do you have any more um, intelligence or reflections about what you're hearing or seeing? I haven't heard anything different than what Amy and Amy and um, you know others have highlighted. I mean, it really is burnout on both the parents, the kids, and the staff, everybody, right? Um, I'm, it's the concern about morale. And how we just keep everyone with the, keep everyone's chins up for the next couple of months. Yeah. Thank you all. Is there anyone who hasn't had a chance to share that would like to? And Amy, I do. I note that you still have your hand raised. Amy B. Okay. Anyone else? Cynthia. Yeah. Hey, Morgan. Thank you so much. I just kind of want to piggyback a little bit on what Katie was saying too um, about food security. And while I understand. Um, Perhaps our early care and education system isn't functioning the same and not as many children might be in childcare. I do wonder about, are there opportunities to really create stronger links between our K-12 food system and our early care and education system? And I think about in terms of, as a former early childhood director, you know, if I didn't, if I had really good food in my program and I had it every day and I didn't have to think about that, that's one box checked off. Kids are getting well nourished. I don't have to think about it. Um, you know, we if food could go home with with families at the end of the day, it creates this opportunity to to relieve some stress, get some good food to kids, and we have systems that we might be able to activate with some organization around it. And, and to Katie's point, a lot of those waivers are going to go away at the end of December. But I do I do think there's opportunity there that would sort of um, by proxy have have double, you know, bang for the buck, if you will, um, in relieving some stress, getting some good food to kids and families. So I just wanted to piggyback onto that. Thank you, Cynthia. It's a great opportunity again for us to figure out if there are cross sector strategies and things that we can be sharing to, to strengthen our work. Um, any final comments before we move before we move on. Go ahead, Amanda. I just had a quick tidbit to add because I had a conversation yesterday with Mary Murray, who's the new, I get her title wrong. Um, family support coordinator at the Milton Family Community Center. And she was curious if there's work being done in any of our communities, um, strengthening a link to the birthing centers. Um, so she was curious about, you know, what are the materials that parents and families are leaving the hospital with? Do they know that there's this array of services um, and more robust than ever, you know, the food access piece being highlighted here. Um, so what can we do to ensure that those new families going home feel supported in a time where um, they're typically isolated and now they're, you know, it, compounded by COVID, they're really isolated. So just highlighting that, um, don't forget about those, those new babes. Thank you so much, Amanda. And for folks who are able to follow up with Amanda to be able to make those connections, please do that so that we can uh, make those connections for families. Go ahead, Ian. Morgan and folks, I do have one more thing. Um, I really appreciated those statistics that were just shared. Um, we talked about statistics and I think something that I heard that maybe hasn't been mentioned is that um, the providers are feeling, there's a lot of talk about school, but that it's a given that you know child cares will stay open. And I think many of them feel resigned to that. They don't feel particularly great about it. But as somebody said on the call yesterday, it's like we've been on a seesaw and now we're on the part of the seesaw that's closer to the ground, but we still might fall off. And so might our families, which I thought was an interesting analogy. And, and at the same time, I think they, they want honesty and candor and they want to hear these statistics 
they know that someone might get COVID and will get COVID and people are getting COVID, um, but they wanna be spoken to honestly. The other thing that came up is that somebody said, um, yes, it's about keeping up morale, but it goes beyond that. And it goes to um, what I kept hearing was about buttressing and nurturing mental health. And somebody brought up a class called uh, Mental Health First Aid that maybe some of you are familiar with. I found it in my, I asked them to send me the link. It was happened in August, I guess. And um, it was, um, anyway, they were saying, we wish there was something like this for us or that it would be repeated. This was Vermont Youth Mental Health First Aid Course for DCF Family Services, Kin, Foster and Adoptive, adoptive Families. So that was a kind of a concrete suggestion that I wanted to pass along. That's great. Thank you so much, Amy. And, and if folks are healer, hearing calls for certain things from families, from providers, from any of our community-based agencies and partnerships, you know, let us know because the other thing that's happening in tandem with this group being held right now is another uh, public-private partnership call with the Child Development Division and the Agency of Education to try and figure out how together with Building Bright Futures and community partners, we can be supporting kids and families and providers right now. So we will, as we're taking all this information from this team, we will feed it back and, and have that crossover to make sure that we all are hearing the same things and figuring out a more cohesive strategy. So super helpful. Um, Hi, Morgan. Yes, go ahead. Brina. Uh, the other pathway that I'm sure you're, you guys are noticing, but um, the governor will talk about what we tell him to talk about he's incredibly open to what are the messages that are, um, would be helpful. And so we, we obviously elevate schools a lot and ask them to remind people they're safe. The pediatricians augment that. So what do we want him to say about childcare? I think that everything you're sharing this morning is a good reminder that childcare, I don't want them to be resigned to it, but I also do know that they, you know, the care of children is right in the center and they just get up and do it every day. And I think if he could, I mean, in the past he thanked childcare, but it has, it's been a while. So Morgan, maybe you and I can think about how to craft a message for the governor to share that helps us feel that he sees, he sees that field, right? That's perfect. Yep. I'm happy to help. It's a great idea. And again, I think the, the more that we can have the collective, here's what the early childhood field is saying that the governor can then reflect back to the field to say, yeah, we heard you. This is what we're hearing. This is what the rest of the state needs to know. I think, um, I think that's great. Okay, so, you know, I do wanna move us to the next section of our agenda, but I think that one of the most important reasons to hold this meeting is what we just did in this first 45 minutes, which is making these connections across our different sectors, seeing where we need to align our messaging, seeing how uh, how we're all thinking about how COVID is impacting kids, families, and our, our workforce, including each one of us, right? And how to support each other in, in the mental health arena. Um, I, you know, we talked a lot about data this morning. And for me, every single one of the factors we discussed this morning really will impact kids and families, not just today, but over the course of time. And we don't even know what that impact will look like and in what ways, but that is part of the reason this group is so important. You know, the role of this group is really to be monitoring the activities and um, the outcomes for goal one, which is all children have a healthy start of Vermont's early childhood action plan. So it's the first time in action plan history, if you'll allow me to go there, that we have indicators and outcomes associated with each of the goals. And it's up to this group to really say, okay, we understand where, what we're trying to measure, how we're making progress, where we need to put our efforts. And it's also about stepping outside of our individual silos. So today's call is so important for you to hear from each other, but to be able to now say, okay, we recognize the importance of nutrition. We recognize the importance of home visiting. We recognize the importance of the entire system and that everyone has their critical role and being able to have a, a unified voice and seeing this kind of service system or resources trajectory for kids and families versus uh, you know, again, being stuck in our silos and, and feeling like we are competing for resources and those types of things. It's, it's really the call to this group to say, 
let's do some of this work together and have more alignment so that we can have a unified front to the rest of the state. Okay, so um, Beth, I'm gonna transition to you and talk a little bit more again about the common vision for this group and talk more about VCAP. Um, I really appreciate the, the sharing this morning. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna invite you to, um, I'm gonna walk you through a visualization for us to kind of get to that big picture place, especially after knowing that we are all feeling, or many of us are feeling a lot of stress um, and, and exhaustion. So um, I'm gonna do a little screen share um, and also invite you to turn off your video as I walk you through this visualization um, as we think about kind of our big picture. Okay. So our articulated vision is that Vermont aspires to realize the promise of each and every Vermont child by ensuring that the early childhood system is an integrated, continuous, comprehensive, high quality system of services that is equitable, accessible, and will improve outcomes for all children in the prenatal period to age eight and their families. We have an incredible opportunity um, in many ways because um, <laughs> uh, we have just uh, revised the Vermont Early Childhood Action Plan because of all that um, is happening right now with the COVID-19 pan pandemic. Um, and, um, you know, our system has been disrupted and we have opportunities to improve it. Um, and um, in opportunities to um, build connections and break down the silos to do our work more efficiently and collaboratively. So, so let's envision <laughs> a child um, and, and I've done a screen share of, of if you wanna look at a picture of a child or close your eyes um, so that we can recenter um, in our work together, um, both in the immediate that we've been talking about this morning as well as the, the long game. Um, I invite you to turn off your video, um, close your eyes, sit up nice and tall and go and feel your feet Feel your heels, your toes, bottoms of your feet. Feel the bottoms of your hands just resting on your thighs. Relax your shoulders. Relax your jaws. Take a nice inhale. Just a regular inhale and then exhale. And then make the next inhale just a little bit longer. And exhale. Inhale again and exhale just a little bit longer. And I invite you to take a moment to picture a baby. This baby is born five years in the future, far from this current pandemic public health crisis. And this baby is born in 2026 here in a Vermont town. Take a moment to think about where that child is born. And take a moment to visualize the baby their surroundings and the people around them. From prenatal through birth, newborn, and as the child grows, what is established to help this child succeed? What is the family doing? What's the community doing? What are legislators doing to support this baby as they grow from newborn into toddler and beyond? As you're formulating that picture in your mind of this baby born in 2026 in a Vermont town, you wanna write down a few notes or hold that in your mind and come on back. Take one, open your eyes, take another deep breath 
and come on back. And I would love to be able to have a, a share. What does that community look like that is holding that baby in 2026? Is there anyone who would like to start? What do you see? And I have a question prompt in the chat bar as well. I don't mind sharing that. Um, I was really envisioning an opportunity for really robust family leave where families are able to make the choice to stay home for a year or more with their new addition, um, where they have employment support to do that. Um, I'm thinking very much of the Scandinavian countries when I did a year abroad there um, to help them create this, this nuclear family the way that they really want to and that they have realistic opportunity um, about staying home, staying solvent um, with economic supports to do that. Thank you. I'm gonna say the obvious thing. There's abundant childcare <laughs> of high quality um, wherever it's needed geographically. Um, and the workforce is paid what they deserve. This is Brina. I went straight to housing. It was a really good exercise, Beth. Thank you for that. I guess I'm cold this morning and I just went straight to a warm house that's safe. Mm -hmm. So I'll pick up off of Brina, um, same vein. I went, I was just thinking about poverty, like Cynthia, what you mentioned around like an opportunity for families to lead that was the positive foot I started on, but I'll be really honest, this activity made me nervous and fearful. And as much as I'm an optimist, I felt, I just didn't, I just, it was hard for me to feel that optimism. I think there is an opportunity for family lead, but then I went to that place of, but families can't, the cards are stacked against them. It's harder for them to do that successfully when poverty still exists. And if families really can't meet their basic needs, um, it's just hard on, it's, it's hard to get to that aspirational place. Um, so I'm usually not so much of a pessimist, but, but this was challenging and, and I'm, I'm feeling, you know, more and more like an old lady in the sense that, you know, I'm now at the point where I'm like, oh, kids these days and they're remote learning and, you know, I'm, I'm just nervous. Is this a tipping point? Are we shifting to more remote, to more virtual? Does that mean less human in-person interaction in the future? Um, I'm nervous about it. So if someone has more of an optimistic go, please, please go next so you can help pick me up a little bit. <laughs> well, I don't know that I'm more optimistic, but I, I'm sort of following that thread, Renee. I was just um, heard some uh, presentations at the, Nash, uh, the New Hampshire Vermont Public Health Association annual meeting held virtually. I'm sorry, and Beth. Can I can I ask you to hold hold your reflection? I think I want to I want to capture all of our vision places before we move on to the analytical. So if if you can just hold that, um, I just oh, want to uh, capture where people were at in 2026 in this oh, image of a child. Well, I was just going to we'll say that, that that image was t uh, tied to economic. Quality, economic opportunity is where I was going with that. Thank you. Great. Absolutely. Robin? I, I want all children and their families to be accepted for who they are. Thank you. Any other images? Sorry to cut you off, Beth, but any other images of this child and their family and community in 2026? Think the, what do we want to hold on to? Go I ahead. think the piece that um, when you were talking about like what is the legislature doing, 
the first thing I thought was people understand and value prevention <laughs> and that money flows into preventative efforts. And then that finally happens. Um, that's my, I hope sooner than 2026, but yeah, that's kind of where mine went. Thank you. They have enough food in their fridge and on their horizon. Thank you, Katie. I was, um, this, yeah, this is Auburn. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about the community connectedness of this family when I was just thinking about this baby's face and um, being born into um, uh, a community that cares that this child was born, they want to visit, um, a community that um, has uh, it, a family, con you know, connected to the family through um, various organizations or clubs or supportive gatherings that's connected you know it could be church it could be um it could be preschool it could be you know um i also i have to i confess i thought of like you know this super supportive home visitor that comes in and is just helping mom and baby or dad mm. and baby grow and bond and um, so I really went to connectedness in my head. It's probably because we're so, we're so isolated now that I went there, but, um, I feel like that's such a huge part of, um, you know, health and resilience and the child outcomes we're looking for is that connectedness, right? Thank you. If there's anyone who, who hasn't shared and wants to add into the chat bar, please do. So. What I'm gonna invite is that um, we're, we're gonna name this child and this, and, and I'll write this into a child, a persona that this group will hold in our work um, because 2026 is the, the new date, the revised Vermont Early Childhood Action Plan. Um, our, you know, we're, uh, our vision to realize um, so much of what you all have described. And so as we move in and um, we are going to transition to really explore this revised document that you all have had input on um, because we need to uh, see ourselves in the plan um, and know what's there to be able to use it. Um, so that is that is part of our task um, and our uh, for the rest of our time today. Um, Morgan, I wonder if this is a good time for me to hand it back to you. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I really appreciate that reflection exercise. And I really think it's important for us to, to come back to why we're doing this work, right? And that was a very clear way for us to, to kind of come back to, this is about supporting our youngest, most vulnerable kids and their families over the next five years. How are we planning to do that? Um, so, you know, we want to talk a little bit more about this year's iteration and how we've revised Vermont's early childhood action plan. So for those of you who have been, you know, so integrated into this plan for so long, we're hoping that you are now seeing yourselves um, very well reflected, not only in this visual, but in this entire plan. Um, so in this iteration, what you're seeing on the right hand side of your screen, and for those of you who are not, um, who are not able to see the, the PowerPoint slide deck, if you go to Building Right Futures webpage and go navigate to Vermont's Early Childhood Action Plan, the newest draft is on that page. It's called, uh, it's labeled 111820. It is not the final formatted, everything is complete from graphic design. Beth also posted it in the chat bar, but that is the most recent draft that we're working with graphic design to finalize. So you can see the visuals and what we're talking through. So what's on the screen right now on the right is again, this concentric, this concentric circles visual, this ecological systems framework and four aligned goals. So this year we have revised uh, from six goals to four. And the first is to, uh, to ensure that all children have a healthy start. Um, and how we've defined goal one is ensuring that children are healthy, thriving, developmentally on track from the prenatal period through third grade by promoting and monitoring outcomes in the following domains. So physical health, developmental, development and educational outcomes, mental health outcomes, and basic needs outcomes. 
Uh, this goal is also promoting the importance of early identification uh, across those same domains. At the next level, and, and I should say that all of these are so connected. So things that we're monitoring in goal one, you will see reflected in every other goal as this kind of uh, nested model. Goal two is that families and communities play a leading role in children's well-being. So here we're talking again about family and community resilience. How are we creating uh, really rich relationships at both of those levels? And how are we um, how are we providing families opportunities and communities opportunities for leadership? Uh, how do we you know improve sensitive, consistent, invested caregivers, uh, knowing that those are those are the key components of uh, a child's developmental trajectory. Goal three is that all children and families have access to high quality opportunities that meet their needs. And again, uh, we're talking about the broader services, resources, and supports that are supporting kids and families within all layers of our infrastructure. And then finally, at the systems level, goal four is that the early childhood system will be integrated, well-resourced, and data-informed. So again, how do we take everything we know from goal one all the way up and make sure that we are using evidence, using these stories, using um, what we know that's happening on the ground for kids and families and elevating it to inform service provision and policy? So um, as we're thinking about monitoring outcomes, specifically for goal one, but for every one of these layers of the infrastructure, I wanna make sure that this group knows that in, in previous iterations, Building Bright Futures has hosted Vermont Insights, which has been a really great data portal uh, that provides publicly accessible uh, information on kids and families. We have gone back to the original vision of Vermont Insights and are standing up what we are now calling Vermont's Early Childhood Resource Data and Policy Center. The timing of that uh, center and that web page is going to be timed with the Howard Vermont's Young Children and Families Report, so you will have access to it in January. It's something that we are building right now. But essentially, what we've heard and what we've seen is that there's no centralized place for you to look at all of the indicators for kids and families. So we're putting together, similar to what our agency partners have done in their silos and in sectors, a scorecard or a data dashboard across all of our different outcomes. Uh, and I can talk about uh, that center a little bit later if folks are interested in what else will be there, but that is one of the, the key things for this group is that there will be a VCAP indicators or outcomes data dashboard. You can go to the next slide. So again, just a quick reminder, when we're thinking about outcomes for kids and families, this group is really focusing on that first VCAP goal. All children have a healthy start. And again, we, we just talked about what that means, but here's some pictures of cute little kids to remind you of, again, why we are focused on this. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, so for those of you who may not have had a chance to look through the VCAP, again, for every goal, we've identified a series of indicators that map to telling us whether or not children are reaching optimal potential within different domains, physical health, mental health, developmental and educational outcomes and basic needs outcomes. And the way we identified these indicators was going again to probably 10 different data sources or scorecards that our state agencies have put out that monitor their own strategic plans and we centralize them into one place. Uh, we also are pulling from national data and, and a couple of other sources to have an even more robust picture. So I know it may be a little bit challenging to see. This is just to make sure that everyone has seen that these are the indicators as of this year that we are intending to monitor on an annual basis, regardless of whether it's an intermediate outcome or a five-year indicator. These are things that consistently every year through this data center, you will be able to see a snapshot of exactly where we are in each of these domains. And so what we've tried to do is say, here are the indicators uh, and then where we are desiring to see change. So at goal one, if we are talking about uh, the percent of women receiving prenatal care, is that something we want to increase, decrease? Is this really a bi-directional relationship? And it's really dependent on a range of factors, whether or not we'd want to see that increase or decrease. So you're seeing uh, the arrows reflect uh, that, that directional relationship. Um, before I go forward, are there any questions about, again, how we came up with these indicators? And this is by no means the, the only things that we will be tracking. The center will have a range of other outcomes, but uh, for this, this uh, current year's vision of the indicators that can be adjusted over time, 
this is where we've landed for physical health outcomes. Morgan, I don't particularly have a, a question about how these were, how you derived, you know, arrived at this particular. I am curious, and you might get to this later, about data development, just in relation to the center. Um, so I can just put a pin in that, but it is something I'm thinking about. Um, when you say development, you mean the agenda for how we decide what we're monitoring, or can you say a little bit more? Sure. Uh, both from uh, uh, systems perspective of how we collect data, what data we collect, um, and the mechanisms that are available to help us collect comprehensive data. And again, I know that this is a big issue, um, but then when that data becomes available, how might we look at inserting some of those data points to help create a better picture? And of course, I'm, I'm thinking food security in my head, and there's just this whole void around what that looks like in early childhood settings, um, but we don't have that data, right? So it's that, it's that kind, it's that yes and. Um, and yeah. again, I know that's a huge question and I'm totally ready to put a pin in it, but I, I am thinking about it in terms of um, the announcement you just made about Vermont Insights changing over to the center. Yes, yep, so um, I, in some ways I'll address it a little bit indirectly and then say for, for the next agenda, we are really talking even more in depth about indicators, but, um, for this center, it, it will be a public-private partnership. We'll also be partnering with the University of Vermont uh, and expanding our ability and our data capacity in the state. It will also be paired with the State Advisory Council's recommendations to increase our data infrastructure, to increase Vermont's ability in the area of data literacy. Uh, it will also be really important that this group, among other groups, comes together and says, this is what data we're missing. These are the gaps. Here's how we should prioritize it. It'll also have opportunities for us to put together early childhood data spotlights similar to what you're talking about in terms of uh, food insecurity. And, and maybe it's, here's the one thing we know and here's what we don't know and that's why it's important, right? So um, yes, I can uh, in future iterations of this meeting talk more about this data center and what we're hoping for it to be and also are looking for folks to be driving that vision collectively. What is the data we need? How does it need to be presented? So. It's a great question. I'm also going to jump in and just say that we have a data and evaluation uh, VCAP committee meeting this afternoon at one o'clock, and you're welcome to join. Um, that uh, is focused. So this is like this VCAP that we're going through is the big five-year plan, um, but each each committee does have its own its own work plan, which includes some of this. Um, uh, some of the details about how to really be moving this forward and how to be using data to inform policy. Perfect plug, Dora. And for those of you who haven't heard, Dora is transitioning into our uh, data and policy director role at Building Bright Futures. So really excited about that. So I wanna keep us moving forward in the slide deck uh, for the sake of time, I know we're a little bit behind, but what I wanted you to see um, is again, that we have pulled indicators that are already there in some ways. And now it's our, our responsibility to centralize and monitor them. So uh, what you're seeing is a very quick snapshot from the maternal and child health um, and VDH scorecard. And this is just one example of how they are presenting information uh, consistently on breastfeeding. So the percent of infants that are breastfed exclusively for six months, you're seeing the dotted line and that is the benchmark. And then the blue line is where we are now. On the right, you're seeing the trend over time. Um, and then cut these arrows of directionality for where we are headed, whether we're, we're doing well or not. So again, this is something that we will be monitoring. It may not look visually exactly the same through the center, but uh, just an example of how this is being monitored today. Next slide. Uh, this is the quick snapshot of mental health outcomes. And I, I apologize, I'm not sure whether or not your screens are as blurry as mine in seeing this visual, so I apologize for that. Okay, um, but what you're seeing is a snapshot of when we're looking at mental health outcomes, some of the examples of the indicators that we will monitor both at the intermediate level and five-year outcomes. Next slide. And this is an example of how it's being monitored right now. So this is the flourishing indicator. It's from the National Survey of Children's Health. Again, what you're seeing um, in that 80% dot is the target and then the actual value for where we are in the state of Vermont at 68% in 2017. 
And what you're seeing um, is that, again, these indicators are being monitored in a range of places. So this one is specifically in the state health improvement plan. So again, how do we centralize some of this? Next indicators. Great. Um, so really exciting for us to be thinking about developmental and educational outcomes with this group. Uh, I think that sometimes we, we get stuck again in our silos and we're either talking about zero to three, three to five, uh, you know, our early childhood uh, education outcomes, but this is our opportunity to think about all of those things collectively together and how are we monitoring some of this work. Um, so this is the range of outcomes and here is the next, nope, go ahead. Uh, and here is, here is one example of how it's monitored at, at the state level. So again, percent of children who have developmental screening in the first three years of life, uh, the benchmark at 95%, and then you're seeing uh, where we are as of 2013 and the trend line. Uh, again, the, another important thing to know is that there's regional variation in some of these things. And that's uh, another thing you can expect to see in this center website and through the Howard Vermont's Young Children and Families Report. Next slide. And finally, uh, in goal one, we are also monitoring basic needs outcomes. And uh, here again, there's a range of different ways that we're talking about meeting the basic needs of kids and families. The key example we wanna pull out here is of WIC. And so uh, it's not tracked in the same way through our scorecard. So this will be something that's pulled in in a different way for the center. But what we wanted to provide a snapshot of is that this Women, Infants and Children program served 11,300 pregnant women infants and children in 2019. And so that's 62.4% of eligible participants, which tells us there's approximately 6,700 additional folks who may be eligible or are eligible for WIC but aren't enrolled. And I think, um, you know, again, as we're thinking about monitoring outcomes, we're also looking for where are there opportunities for us to improve. And this to me is a really great example of uh, cross-sector program that can really support this work. We also wanted to just quickly bring in some of our regional work and what we're hearing from regional partners. Uh, again, as we think about the early childhood infrastructure and the Building Bright Futures infrastructure of over 300 plus people, we have 12 regional councils. And, and one of the ones that we wanted to highlight this morning is the Springfield Council. And again, uh, that council has been really focused on basic needs and supporting food insecurity and nutrition by connecting uh, families with WIC. Um, so one of the ways that they've described this work is that the families that are enrolled in these programs are able to meet their education requirements through programs put on at early care and education centers. Um, and so they are actually being seen by WIC specialists within the centers, and that is reducing a ton of bar other barriers that we talked about this morning, right, about transportation, about, um, about you know, their time out of work. Uh, and it also is establishing some really strong relationships with cross-sector partners. So just really wanting to highlight that there are uh, examples within regions of where this, this is going really well, and how can we build on some of those opportunities? Um, and Dora, uh, just so all of you know, Dora, Beth and I have been working really hard with our team on the 2020 Howard Vermont Young Children and Families Report. It was approved by the State Advisory Council on Monday, and we are finalizing content actually by tomorrow. Uh, so you will see information on basic needs and food security in that iteration as well. Um, so I'd love to just pause and say, you know, is there anyone who, who in this group wants to speak a little bit about that project or talk a little bit about um, the range of indicators that we were just speaking about? I'll just say that I think it's incredibly exciting, Morgan and team, that this action plan has a really robust sort of new look, new vision. Um, I think it's an amazing body of work and I just really, really appreciate it because I do think it has such value or could have such value um, for our policy and investment areas. So thank you to your whole team. Awesome, thank you so much, Cynthia. I really agree with what Cynthia said. It's a breath of fresh air. I feel like it really organizes the, a lot of thinking really well, love the visuals. Um, and I love the WIC example that you gave and um, would love to 
um, be part of thinking about any way of replicating that work. I, I think it's a really exciting opportunity. I think that that's such an exciting um, example of when, when we're talking about uh, collaboration and cross cutting, you know, that, that there is, I know that uh, Let's Grow Kids has been, has been working with hunger vital signs screening and, um, and, you know, making this connection, again, what we were, what's been brought up a couple of different times, but um, these sort of cross cutting, um, really, we're all working towards the same vision and how can we be doing this more efficiently and effectively and really trying to break down those silos. Really exciting to just be thinking about these collaborations. I'm just wondering also just where, a wonderful oh, ex go ahead Beth. I was just gonna say a wonderful example of how that data can really illuminate our work. I mean, that data was really compelling about the WIC statistics. Yeah, I'm thinking, uh, yes, I second all what's been said and I'm wondering about how to move this kind of work closer to family engagement work and to hear from families because to be honest, when I, when I see that statistic about the number of families that are eligible um, that could be enrolled but aren't, I think about family choice and family preference. And so my worry is that we're aiming like, oh, we've got all these families that are eligible. We have to get everybody who's eligible access to WIC. That really feels driven from a practitioner level and not necessarily from a family level. And so I would kind of, you know me, I'm very curious. I'd want to kind of crack the top off that um, to hear more about you know, the families who might have been hesitant to join who now are and that, but I just, I, I'm thinking about that link between what we want to do with family voice and elevating family voice and want to make sure that even when we have something amazing like this happening where we're connecting people to the food resources that they need, I don't want us kind of <clears throat> bulldozing our way through the system thinking we're, you know, it's like the helper syndrome. We're doing good things. We're doing good things. Well, families might be eligible, but they might have a whole vast number of reasons why they, they don't want to enroll. So rather than kind of burn our energy out trying to get those numbers to 100%, being able to really explore um, parent choice within that system. It, it's, it's such a great point, Renee, and it, it also speaks to why I think it's really important that we don't assign direction for all of these indicators, right? So it's really, I, I think a lot about that when we're thinking about, um, you know, the transition from early intervention to special education, right? So, you know, in some cases we're like, we wanna make sure that everyone's transitioning to, to early childhood special education. But when we're looking at rates of who's eligible, who has access, are we seeing that, that early intervention did this really incredible job of supporting families and children don't need that same level of support once they get to the education system? Or are we having a gap and we really do need to make sure that families are, are having that same transition and access? So yeah, it's a really, really great point and, and speaks again to one of the things that the State Advisory Council and I would hope early childhood partners are really thinking about right now, which is how do we partner with parents and families to be gauging that that input um, and trying to understand how this work resonates or doesn't with with what they're uh, struggling with. Um, yeah, one thing too to just kind of tack on to I totally agree with everything Renee just shared and but also thinking of like I think one of the opportunities of the pandemic words you never thought would come out of people's mouths but um, is that it's a chance for us to change the way that we talk about things and to really address stigma so a family might have whatever reasons they have for not wanting to en enroll and participate in WIC or SNAP or school meals or whatever it might be. Um, but to not have the cultural stigma be the piece that's getting in the way. Um, and I feel like that is a place where we have a ton of opportunity and a ton of, of there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of group wisdom that we can use to, to try and to try and kind of combat that. So that's not what's getting in the way. 
Thank you, Katie. You read my mind, right? <laughs> and there's, like, there's so many have, people who are using those programs now that never did exactly. before, but it's really opened things up in a way that is a silver lining for sure. Right. And it goes back to our initial conversation on this call, right? Like we have a lot of work to do in terms of messaging, disseminating information and doing some like real training and support, right? And what Katie's speaking to, like part of what she's been doing with Elizabeth and others is you know, they did put together a training and we were thinking about food insecurity, specifically food insecurity work, but, you know, there's a trickle down approach here, right? Like even some of this information and data that we're going over, how does that get messaged to early child care providers so that they understand what's happening at the state system? But then how does that get translated into how we give them the tools that then, or anyone, right, in direct service with families and children's right now, children right now, how do we give them the information and tools, right, so that that all of this information flows the way it's supposed to through the system, and the providers have the tools to do this, right, whoever it is, whatever direct service provider it is, has exactly what they need in hand to refer those families, support those families, help them get food, et cetera, right? Yeah, and so we do have some work in terms of education and dissemination of information. Absolutely. Thank you. It's coming up, right? <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, I do, we have six minutes left in our time together today. So I, I now want to pose another question, a final reflection question to this group. Uh, because again, I think it's really important that we, we did spend the time early on coming together and talking about our priorities. And now looking at this new iteration of Vermont's Early Childhood Action Plan, where do you see yourselves? Where do you see uh, your role, your, um, your organization's role in this plan? And how can we use this plan to inform more cross-sector partnership and integration in this next year? So how do we put this into action for this year? And where is your role? I'll just jump in quickly because I do have to jump off. I'm sorry, Morgan. Um, I, through my lens with, well, I have several lenses, both with Vermont AYC and um, helping educators. So to Tanya's point about educators receiving information and um, that connection to the providers from that perspective, there's opportunity there. Uh, and my hat with that organization um, to help disseminate some information to some of the providers and to, to build it into perhaps teacher preparation education programs and the work that we're doing there. So that's one hat and one connection, I think, um, globally. We could look at, I think the other connection is through my um, work with Shelburne Farms and Vermont Feed. And I'm very interested in looking at sort of that farm to early childhood. We have also talked about that WIC connection. Um, and I can just say that we have really great connections with the Agency of Agriculture. Uh, and we have been priming them to actually invest uh, money in, in food acquisition that would go directly to early childhood programs. So again, I think there's an opportunity um, there to just think about food security within the early childhood program setting um, and access our agency of ag partners to do that, so. Thank you, Cynthia. And thank you for being with us today. I think for me, um, Again, thinking about the just the Head Start connection and knowing that you know Head Start has always been about comprehensive services, so um, they're just a little bit pushed ahead of the curve, I think, in terms of recognizing the importance of health, uh, mental health, physical health, health nutrition, uh, and its foundation for learning and optimal outcomes for kiddos. So, um, you know, and and we do. I know that. Head Start's relationship with Department of Health and WIC offices, you know, it does vary throughout the state, um, but we do have some excellent uh, examples of regions where that's working well. Um, so for me, it's wanting to think very strategically about how to amplify that good work. Um, again, let's not reinvent wheels. Um, there are opportunities to build those relationships, and it's more about just finding them, shining a light on them, and then supporting the folks who haven't quite gotten there yet in, in whatever they need to, to implement. So um, that's, that's what I'm taking away from it. Thank you, Renee. Any other final reflections in the last minute or so? Yeah, 
you couldn't end a meeting without me talking again, right? Um, <laughs> um, I, you know, I just want to say that I see the work uh, that I do. One of the things that I kind of hold and intersect with a lot is that equity piece. Um, and so, you know, that's reflected in the early childhood action plan in the most recent draft in a variety of ways, but I, I just want to leave us with always holding that all of us and coming back to that and seeing ourselves in that work. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, so, you know, I know that these meetings, are, you know, they're a significant amount of time. We really appreciate all of you coming together. We find that this is such critical, important work, and we really appreciate you coming to the table and being vulnerable. I'd love to ask that over the next month or so that this group takes a look, a really solid look at the updated VCAP, looking at the indicators, look at the goals, the strategies and objectives. And we can talk more in depth about VCAP and, and some of that kind of goal one specific work at our next meeting. I can talk a little bit more about the center and then bring in some, some new data for us to be reflecting on. Then we plan to um, meet to talk about family engagement at our December meeting. Um, we've completed the family engagement assessment. We are nearly done writing the report, um, which is super exciting. Um, so we will um, also bring that data for us to look at um, and digest. So thank you all. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.